Great. Okay. So um, what I'm going to go through is I'm going to start just systematically. So we need to know about the normal aura before you can make sense of the unusual aura. So the first step is moving. Okay. So this is our current definition. Um, so the international definition, and I just want to say about definitions, what's, what's a definition for? So a definition is so that you can represent what you see in the population as reliably as possible. Um, so this is the international classification of or in general. So you can have visual, sensory, speech and language, motor, brainstem and retinal. I'm not going to go into retinal because, to be quite honest, it's not changed through the whole time I've been doing medicine. And um, I don't think we really understand it. So the main thing about aura, because the big thing with aura is, you know, is it stroke? or is it migraine aura, is that it generally comes on gradually. So very few people have very sudden onset aura. And I think if you have sudden onset, you don't really have a choice. You will have to go in A&E to make sure this is not a stroke. Normally it develops over time, over five minutes, um, longer, 20 minutes, and you normally get one aura after the other if you have more than one aura symptom. And the majority of aura symptoms last up to 60 minutes. The aura will then be accompanied by headache, but as I'll show you, it isn't very predictable. So in the majority, you'll get aura and then you'll get headache, but it doesn't always happen. So this is, oh, I don't know where this has come from. Can you see this line? Um, we can, we can see typical aura and headache. Okay, so, um, what you have here is that we have different sorts for your typical aura, but you can get aura without headache, you can get aura with different types of headache, and you can get brainstem aura, which I'm going to go through, and then hemiplegic migraine. But what I really want to also talk about is a vestibular migraine. Now, I just want to check, do you have a blue line on your screen across Yes, we do. We do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have no idea how to get rid of that. Let me just. Um... But that's fine. We can we can still read we can still read it very clearly. Okay, fine. If you hold Control and Z, that might get rid of it. Control Control and Z. Or maybe not. Let me just. Uh, let me just. You, you should be able to select it and delete it. I think. It's finding it very irritating. Um, edit. Or if you close the presentation and reopen it, that'll yeah, probably I get rid of it. That. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so let's really do it. That's better. Okay. It's gone. Yeah, that's gone. So, sorry about that. Um, so this is very interesting. So about a third of people will have migraine with aura, but it's also reported in tension type headache, and cluster headache, cluster headache related disorders, paroxysmal hemicrania, sooner and hemicrania continua. And I think the relevance of that is that when people say, oh, I have migraine, they describe the aura. But actually, migraine is about the headache. It's not about the aura. And it's the headache syndrome that defines the treatment. The aura is a separate issue, which we'll see. So let's get a background idea of what exists. So the migraine prevalence, prevalence meaning how many people at a certain point in time will have this disorder. So the prevalence in the UK of migraine is about 12%. So it's 7% in men, 18% in women. It's three times more common migraine aura than migraine without aura. Um, again, the definition is visual, sensory. Now, when you see dysphasia, this is language. Language meaning what you can understand other people saying, but also your ability to be able to express verbally what you want to say. 
obviously motor and brainstem, which I'm going to focus on. And what we do have is this interesting group where you can also get migraine or any other type of headache with abnormalities of smell and abnormalities of hearing. This gives you an idea of the proportion of individuals who will get aura. So slightly difficult to understand, but essentially this gives you that 37% of people um, who have aura, a quarter of their attacks will be with aura. 25% half their attacks will be aura, gradually reducing, but actually 20%, every single attack will be accompanied by some sort of aura. And the most common, hands down, is your visual aura. So visual only in 40%, but the large proportion of individuals will get visual. Then we have sensory, so that can be normally can be a numbness, a tingling, dysphasic, which is your language. And often it's not the understanding, it's that people can't get their words out. They can't say what they want to say. And then about a quarter will get a combination of symptoms, one after the other. And again, going back to the gradual evolution, so pretty much 90%, it is gradual. So this is why it's always down to the story. You know, all these disorders down to the story because the scan is always normal. Anything that you can get a test on for these disorders is normal because these are abnormalities of brain function and not brain structure. The majority, it's less than 60%, so if it, sorry, 60 minutes. So if it's higher than that, again, is it a secondary cause um, that's precipitating it? In succession, if you have more than one in 90%, simultaneously very uh, uncommon. And then you get headache after uh, aura, but can occur with aura, before aura, and without headache. So this is what uh, the first time we understood what aura was. This was a, um, a physician called Lashley who found that he was getting the typical zigzag fortification spectra and it gradually evolved over about a 20 minute period. And what they found was that if you look at this concept of cortical spreading depression is that in the brain, you can actually see a shutdown from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, which runs exactly at the same time frame as that visual aura. So initially, we've seen this in animals, you can trigger it as an animal model, you can see it in injured brains, but it's been very difficult to show this in a normal human brain, assuming that you know, a migraine brain is a normal human brain. But there are occasional studies, which is this nice one in 2001, which shows exactly this. So this is somebody who's having a visual aura. And what you will see is from the back, you get a gradual, gradual shutdown of neural function. This is not within the distribution of the blood vessels. This is the actual neurons in the brain gradually shut down over that 20 minute period of time. So this takes us to hemiplegic migraine. And the main difference with hemiplegic migraine is that with this, you can get fully reversible motor symptoms, but they last much longer. So this is 72 hours. You also get the visual, sensory, speech, and language. You again get successive evolution of the different aura symptoms. Now, each of the non hemiplegic symptoms, again, will last your six, up to 60 minutes, but the motor aura can last days. The aura, again, typically accompanied by a headache, which normally occurs within 60 minutes, but can occur at any time point. Hemiplegic migraine, there are two types. There's familial and non-familial. And in essence, the familial in the past was you have two first degree relatives. So this is what we call an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, which means there's a one in 50% chance of you passing it down. So this will mean that you have it, your mother has it, your grandmother has it, or you have it, your mother has it, your child has it. And it's from these studies that we've actually found specific genes that cause hemiplegic migraine. Now, the abnormalities in these genes are in different places, but this only accounts for about two thirds of hemiplegic migraine. But what you see is that if you have a gene, that gene will then result in um, the body making a protein, the protein then subserves some sort of function so that we can walk and talk, our gut is normal, you know, our heart functions normally. If you get mutations or abnormalities in this gene, you get an abnormal protein, 
an abnormal function. And what we see here is that there are tens, hundreds of different mutations which can give you the exact same syndrome that you see. In sporadic hemiplegic migraine, there is no family history, but actually if you do the genetics, pretty much all of these don't have the genetic abnormalities. So this will be a slightly different disorder. What's the result of this? So if you actually look at the gene, so you can take the gene out and you can put it into an animal model. You look at a normal animal and an animal with an abnormal gene. And what you find is that the FHM1 gene, um, the gene just hyper functions. So you get a gain in function. In this one, which is a sodium potassium pump, it loses function. In this one, which is a sodium pump, you get a gain of function. And sodium is very interesting because sodium channels evolved in epilepsy. We know migraine and epilepsy can occur more often than in the population. And in certain forms of this type of SHM, they also have a higher proportion who have seizures. And what you get is this cortical excitability. There is pure FHM, which is only in about 4%. And in this, you get a progressive neurological disorder. So with each attack, you're left with disability. Now, a cerebellar syndrome is unsteadiness, unsteadiness of your walking, the way that you control your motor function. In some, you get learning disability, seizures, and some, which is very curious, they will just move their head or slight knock to the head renders them into coma. So these are very rare disorders there is a proportion where it's a progressive neurological disorder. So what we have is a reversible motor weakness, 72 hours usually, three genes we know of, exactly the same syndrome as sporadic, but there's no family history. But look at this prevalence, it's rare. So if you look at normal migraine, it's 12%. This is a tiny proportion. And it occurs in people who are younger. This often occurs with genetic disorders. Usually you will have both the hemiplegia, but also brainstem symptoms. So this was a very nice study. So if you have a look at the motor aura, you get face and tongue involvement in half, hand and arm in almost all, foot and leg almost half, the whole body uh, again in about 30%. And the thing to note here is that the sporadic and the familial by syndrome are similar. Again, they develop gradually. The progression is gradual, but the duration here is much longer. They also have the visual, sensory, and language symptoms. And here you can see also get this in migraine, the typical aura. Again, the visual aura are much more common and typical. Scotoma is a patch in your field that you can't see through. So it might be flashing or it might just be a negative effect. Again, tend to be a little bit longer in the hemiplegic group. The sensory aura, again, we have this in the majority of those who have hemiplegic migraine. Again, gradual progression as per usual, more prolonged than you see in typical aura. So again, the hemiplegics always have a prolonged aura in all of their symptoms rather than the within one hour that you see in your typical migraine. And the difficulty with language. So again, a lot of uh, a high proportion who have language problems compared to those with typical aura and Comprehension, again, it's unusual. It's very unusual. So it's always that they know what you're saying, but they just can't reply to you verbally. Again, mean duration much, much longer. What's very interesting that we have a lot of childhood disorders that develop into adult disorders. And this is a um, disorder which is alternating hemiplegia of childhood. They don't get any progressive symptoms, but we now have found those same genes in these young children. And what you find in these, if you take the gene out to express it in an animal, you get multiple, multiple cortical spreading depressions. We've always thought that, okay, the aura sets the headache off, but it may not be the case. And personally, I think that that's not the case because this was a drug that was specific to aura. So in the lab, it stopped aura. But what you find was it didn't work in most people with migraine. It stopped their migraine with aura attacks, but not without aura. So you remember I said only 20% will have aura with all attacks. So most people will have majority of the attacks without aura and it didn't make a difference. 
Myron with brainstem aura. Now here again, reversible symptoms, but without motor involvement. So dysarthria is slurred speech, vertigo, which I'll explain a little bit more, sensation of movement, tinnitus, the ringing in the ears, everything sounding louder, hyperacusis, double vision, diplopia, ataxia, meaning unsteadiness walking, and a decreased level in consciousness. Usually, again, you have them in succession, very slowly over time, and usually the headaches. So this is going back a little bit more towards the migraine with typical aura within 60 minutes of the aura. And this is a nice study which looked at basilar migraine, as it was known as brainstem. So again, vertigo is the most common. So the vertigo typical thing is either you're spinning around the room or the room is spinning around you. Again, the slurred speech, ringing in the ears, double vision, your typical visual aura that you normally get, less common the sensory aura, and then these episodes will people lose consciousness. Very unusual to get the unsteadiness of walking. So I always have to ask, is it that you're unsteady in the head or unsteady in the feet? Because they are slightly different things. And this is a study of all normal types of aura. So remember when I gave you the definition, I know it's quite a lot to take on, but brainstem aura, you have to have two of those symptoms. Now these are people who have typical aura, visual, sensory, um, motor, but actually a lot of these have dizziness. So look at this, at least half of these just have the dizziness. So dizziness is so, so common. And that's why I want to go through at the end about vestibular migraine. Again, brainstem aura, how long does it last? The majority of these is going to last your 60 minutes here. So 30 to 60 minutes is your average. So in brainstem aura, what you get is migraine with non-hemiplegic aura. So it occurs in 10% of those. Almost all would have your typical visual sensory language. 74% always have a headache. So that means a quarter won't have headache, just the aura symptoms. The most common is vertigo, but about three quarters will have at least two or three symptoms. In, I mean, that is by definition, because actually when you get just the vertigo, we don't call it with brainstem aura. And this is what we mean by vestibular. So this is what I want to go through with vestibular symptoms. What do we mean by vestibular? This is all about the story. This is why I think, you know, people are not good at headache. Physicians are not good at headache because you have to have spend time getting the story. It's not about a test. It's not about the examination. It's always normal. It's about this story. So this spinning, oops, this spinning and rocking, unsteady, remember, is in the head or the feet. This fogginess. So after COVID, we have a lot of people who have brain fog. And some of them, this is a vestibular aura. This is the one people often say they feel drunk or seasick, they're walking on air, coming off a roller coaster. And that equates to what we say is an abnormal sense of motion when you're standing still, either you or the environment. Quite typical is visually induced. Now visually is when people say, I'm standing at the pavement, these cars are all rushing past and my brain and what I see is not functioning at the same pace. It's just completely different pace. That's what we call visual vertigo. Often occurs after you change position with head movement uh, and head movement induce both vertigo and dizziness. So let's have a look at just vestibular symptoms. You can get it in almost half the population if you have a look at the studies. And so a lot of people say, oh, I've had labyrinthitis. Well, the question is, is all labyrinthitis part of this aura phenomenon? Again, more common in females, more common in over the 50 population. And what you find is about 10, 15% will get the spinning. A quarter, it will come and go. 10%, it is in change in position. 5%, there's impairment of hearing, some fullness in the ears or tinnitus, so ringing. But look at this, so 35% have headache. So the background population who have headache is 12%. What we have here is 35% also have headache. This is the prevalence. So this is in a population who has had a positive history of, of vertigo. So if you look at this curve, it peaks at 40, 50. The age of onset, it peaks again at 40, 50. 
but you do get a proportion in the paediatric population, which is onset at um, in one to two percent. So I'm now going to show you the curve for migraine. It's exactly the same. And you could say, oh, well, that's all disorders. Well, no, it's not. Because if you look at Parkinson's, there'll be nothing until you get to around 50 and then it will be exponential. You look at dementia, there'll be nothing. You get about 50, 60, 70, it will go up. You look at epilepsy, it'll peak for genetic epilepsies. It will drop off. It will peak again and keep increasing into older age because we get stroke, we get tumours, we get injuries that set the epilepsy off. So this is exactly the same curve. And this gives you an idea, again, this is the Kelman study of the number of people with normal typical aura who also have dizziness. But because it's just dizziness, you can't call it brainstem, uh, brainstem aura. If you look at other positional uh, vertig vertiginous disorders of benign parasismal vertigo, which is thought to be a little otolith in the ear that moves and causes dizziness, migraine is twice as common. Many airs disease where you get associated deafness and gradually with each attack you get more deaf, half have migraine. There's motion sickness in up to 50% of individuals who have vestibular symptoms. And then this, again, like hemiplegia of um, childhood, this group of people who have paroxysms, paroxysms of childhood vestibular disorders, which then involves a migraine disorder in adulthood. So from this, we get our definition. So the vestibular symptoms I mentioned, they can last between minutes to days. 50% can have migraine as symptoms, and they often have visual symptoms, as we saw in the previous slide with, uh, with a Kelman slide. Um, so 1% to 3% population prevalence, more common in women. It tends to peak around menopause, high proportion of motion sickness or vertigo in childhood. You can get it with headache, but you can get it without headache. In a third, you get it in minutes, hours, days each, but 10% will have daily symptoms, up and down daily. Very high familial tendency, but no single gene. So we now know in, in typical migraine with and without aura, there are 123 Areas, of uh, uh, gene, areas in our genes which are, um, have an increased prevalence than you would have in a normal population. So there are 123 genes that increase your susceptibility to develop migraine at some point in time. So vestibular migraine, as with all types of migraine, there's no diagnostic test. You can respond to vestibular re rehabilitation. And I have to say, I think vestibular migraine is the most disabling migraine because you just can't do anything. And what often they found is that, so you get a physio to do the exercises, but if you do lots of sports, actually that retrains your brain again to accommodate that perception between movement, um, your eyes and your brain, so everything keeps still. There is no acute therapy for aura, this is the problem. So treatment is preventative. And the mainstay of management will in the longer term for people who have disabling migraine will be preventative. How do you treat aura? I've only got a couple of slides because there isn't anything. There's one study that looks at ketamine, um, that's intravenously, that's not something we can use. Um, if you use the triptans, people are often worried, if I use the triptan, is it going to make a difference? Is it going to make it worse? No, it's not going to make it worse, but it's not effective. So we know we have three trials with migraine, with aura, with triptans, and if you take it during the aura, it makes no difference. You have to take it during the pain. This again takes you back that the aura and the headache are two separate processes. You get the two disorders together, but it may not be that one leads to the other. Prevention, again, absolutely the mainstay of management. I can't stress this enough because I've now seen that uh, this makes the biggest difference. If you're a migraineur, you are more sensitive genetically to light, noise, smell, touch. You're more susceptible to lack of sleep, too much sleep, stress, relaxation from stress, missed meals, thundery weather. 
if you don't regulate those, your brain has to work harder. And what I found is the people who just do the drugs, eventually the drugs don't work because nobody can give a drug for you to change your lifestyle and your habits. And eventually they will become not enough. Now, particularly in aura, because there is no acute treatment, the only treatment that's going to work is preventative treatment. And particularly if you don't have frequent aura, it is the lifestyle that is going to regulate how the migraine behaves. We have a nice study in Germany that shows that individuals who did just lifestyle had the same impact as individuals who just took the drugs. And in clinic, what I see is people who just do the drugs, it just doesn't work in the longer term. So all the people who do both, in two years, I can get them out of clinic. If it's just the drugs, they end up having this, that, the other, stimulation, whatever, but none of those work for the long term. You are still left in a clinic and not independent. So in summary, we have visual, sensory, speech, motor, and brainstem. The hemiplegic and the brainstem, you pretty much always get the others. Hemiplegic is rare, so remember 0.0005% of the population. Much more common is this sense of dizziness or motion, or it can occur in any type of headache. So that doesn't define your headache syndrome. Most commonly happens with migraine. This is all genetic. We're getting more and more information about genetics, but the problem is there is no acute treatment and that management absolutely is preventative treatment. So I think I've just got in time and that's the main things I wanted to say. So, um, any questions? Can I ask a question? Actually, sorry, just say, first of all, say thank you, Anish. That was very interesting. So, yes, if people want to ask questions to you on the camera, but I'll also ask some questions that were typed in the chat box. Should I start off? Quickly? Yeah, you go. Um, I've been told by a specialist that I have allodynia as well. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So what allodynia is that <clears throat> if you touch the head, if you don't have pain, you feel fine. But people with allodynia are so sensitive mm -hmm. on the pillow, washing your hair. And what that is, is that whole network is wound up completely. So it's just like putting it on overdrive that what we normally regulate and filter out so it doesn't bother us, like the light, noise, smell, it is also for touch. So that's what we call allodynia. Thank you. My hair hurts me. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Anish, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. I thought it was particularly interesting how you, you said that, that basically that the pain stage of a migraine attack and the aura stage are two different processes. Because we, there was one question asking about acute medication to take at the, the, the premonitory prodrome stage to try and prevent the aura. So really, it, it really is either just preventive medication or lifestyle changes. Yes. So I think the most exciting thing was the tenabastat because you can actually target it. But the problem with that is that it's a good drug for aura. There's not enough people who have aura, so the drug companies won't invest in it. That's the problem. Okay. And with 10 million people in the UK, most with migraine, most people will be treated at the, you know, in primary care with, by their GP. But just even looking at the questions, First of all, these are more complex types of migraine, but it's clear that people are struggling more to access the medication they need and to access the help they need. Mm -hmm. what, what, would some general advice be if you are struggling with these conditions to ask to be referred to a neurologist or a headache specialist? Yeah, I think the first thing, so we just on the BASH guidelines for this purpose so that everybody has equal access to everything. And the way we've done the BASH guidelines is not this drug first, that drug first. It's actually what's right for your patient. Nice is about money. Um, so, but what I would say, so we wanted the Royal College of General Practitioners to okay the guidelines. And actually, I think they were absolutely right. They said, this is too drug orientated. And from what I've seen in my, my tertiary clinics, 
is that if you don't put the right lifestyle stuff in place, you will eventually relapse unless it just settles. Now, the problem is, I mean, neurologists aren't good at migraine or headache. So poor GPs don't have a chance. They have seven minutes. So what we've done is I would go to the MASH guidance. The first thing I always say is, you know, what do you think it is? The majority will be migraine if it's disabling. The others are rare. Tension type headache with disability, it's probably migraine. Keep a diary. Make sure there's no painkiller overuse. And then look at your lifestyle factors. And I think what happens is that people go into the, the clinic to the GP and the GP just gives you codeine and painkillers. So the referrals we get are, you know, this not responding to analgesics. Well, by that time, it's medication overuse. So what I would say is that you as a migraine, you have to teach your GP. You know, I've done so many talks and you get the GPs who will do it, GPs who won't. But actually, if you if you're the person who does it, it will work better because actually most specialists are not much better. Okay. You're probably better. And, and, and leading on from that, that, so if someone has been diagnosed with migraine, but they, they have noticed actually that they are having several different symptoms of aura. Yeah. So they think, they think it's something a bit more complex and their GP isn't responding or, or really understanding that there might be, yeah. they're just focusing on the pain stage. What would, what, what would you recommend to someone? So um, what I'm hoping will be taken up, so I, my two jobs, one job is a, a district general hospital. And what we now have, and I would encourage all GPs to use this, is advice and guidance. So what happens is that they can't, you know, can't necessarily refuse. I think the main thing is they can't refuse to address it. That's a problem. So if they're not sure, they can just email us. And what we do is every day somebody will look at it. And then what happens is they can make a comment and they can convert it to a referral, which means that actually, if you don't need to be seen, you get your uh, opinion immediately. And the other thing is, uh, like I said before, if you can be more educated than your GP is and say, look, this is the BASH guidance. This is what I've looked at the Migraine Trust website. This is what it says, da da. You, you sort of do the work for them but actually, you know, if you leave it to somebody else, it's much harder. Thank you. Uh, th th there was one question of a very, very serious situation that a man is in. He has migraine with brainstem aura. It leaves him unconscious yeah. for, for most of the day, every day. He lives in Northern Ireland. He's tried various types of treatment, including Botox. He's just struggling what to do. And also because in Northern Ireland, it's very hard to get appointments with the neurologist. Yeah. I mean, it's, Throughout the UK, but particularly in Northern Ireland, there's a problem there. What is there any advice that, that you yeah. can give them? So what we're seeing more and more, and um, what I've learned over all these years in this situation is, so I mentioned we have 123 genetic loci now for typical migraine with, without aura. Um, but the highest comorbidity is with um, what we call psychological, but it's neuropsychology. It is all about how that emotional brain manages. And what we've seen with lots of things, even with aura. So I work with a fantastic ENT surgeon who sees a lot of vestibular tinnitus, oral fullness, is that that brain then takes that response, puts it in your memory area, and then that memory area keeps firing because those structures are the same structures. And it's almost trying to retrain the brain because the drugs really don't work. I have a chap who has thunderclap onset and he will get the loss of consciousness. Um, and we've tried everything. The drugs won't work for this. And the only thing I've ever seen that works is retraining the brain from a clinical psychological perspective. Now, a lot of people say, oh, it's, it, it's you know, you think it's my head, it's all in the head. That's is all in the brain. This is a neural problem that you get biochemical changes just from how you behave. And then whatever disorder you have will get will set off. So it might be cardiac, might be Parkinson's. But as migraineurs, I'm a migraineur, there is a higher load of you know that part of the emotional brain that feeds it through. So, you know, I think the facial pain, they've been on this for years pain management we just haven't in the UK but they do it in Europe they do it in the states and I think we need a combination of treatments 
Thanks, Anish. And that, that actually, I'm following on from that, there was a question about um, the impact on mental health. And, and we know that, that, that it's, uh, it's more common for people who have migraine to have um, struggle yeah. with um, anxiety and depression. Is, it, is, it, is there actually anything particular about rarer types of migraine, such as these? Um, I think yeah, the answer is yes. I think particularly with the brain stem and vestibular, because the vestibular is just so disabling. Um, and again, it's the same thing that it's shown that there is a higher propensity. So when it's episodic, slightly different, when it's chronic, they feed into each other. There's a catch 22. And the problem, if it's not drug responsive, then we have to, we have to do something about it in a different way. Um, and this is not just about treating the comorbid mood and anxiety, that makes it easier. But this is finding a different way that we process what is happening to us. So it has, so it's not disabling, so we can cope with it. So people there who have been, most people who do go to see a new, uh, psychologist will say, actually, particularly with the pain, my symptoms are no different. I can do everything now. I don't have to go out with my mum. I go out with my friends. I start to do a job and then the whole thing starts to wind down. So, it, it, and you have to remember, this is a multi, um, it's not just pain, it's all those different sensory, it's all the emotional things that come. So it's the whole brain that's being involved. Yeah. Thank you. And we've, we've had a lot of questions about different types of treatments. We know people are asking, what should they take? And obviously over the past few years, it, it's been very positive in terms of migraine treatments. Yeah. And, and as, as you said, um, preventives are um, in terms of actually preventing um, aura, the, the preventives are the key. So is, is there anything that you would say about some of the new treatments that have become available or some that are likely to become available in the next year? Yeah, so I think uh, we'll see the proof will be in the pudding, basically. Um, but I suspect they will probably work in a similar manner. So if we now, you know, we'd have this head to head with the pyramid and the monoclonals. Um, so, you know, whether they will have a disproportionate impact on aura, I don't know. I don't know. But because they weren't targeted towards aura, perhaps not. Whereas flunarazine that we don't get in the UK, <clears throat> which you can get uh, in Europe, is particularly useful for aura. So it works on specific calcium channels. And we know one of those genes was a calcium channel gene. Brilliant. Thanks, Anish. So I've asked um, some, of the, some of the questions in the chat. Would anyone like to ask Anish a question on camera themselves? So I've got Laura here. We've got three people with their hands up. Uh, Una? Yeah. So would, 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 would you like to go ahead and um, choose who to go first? So, Alan? Hi. Uh, uh, you, you were actually discussing uh, earlier on, I'm the person from Northern Ireland. Uh, I've, I've looked at several things here and I've come across a thing called, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it right, is occipital nerve stimulation. Yeah. And if that is an avenue to go down, because in Northern Ireland here, we have very little help. And uh, uh, we're just at our wits our, end. At really, our wits end. I mean, this has been going on for 15 years every day. So I think um, the clinical evidence is that occipital nerve stimulation doesn't really work in my brain. Um, it seems to anecdotally work better with some of the cluster headache related disorders. Um, and, you know, what it does in aura, I think the best case scenario, you might get a 30% response. Is it going to stop the aura? You know, we haven't shown that. So I think a lot of people have stopped using occipital nerve stimulation because actually, it doesn't work that well in migraine. And, and that's from a sham study. Um, I think we need something better. We need something better than that. And you know, the whole thing with, I mean, some people very much drugs, 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 treatments, fixes. But unfortunately, what the clinical studies have shown is that if you are on top of the disorder and you can manage it, um, then you just do much better. Yeah. Um, what is the best way of getting referred? 
from the treatment that I've received from other neurologists here, it has been, they put me on medication, worked it up over three or four months, didn't work, stopped it, started another one. And this just went on dozens of treatments. So it did. Uh, and we're wondering, you know, there's there's not as much over here. What's the best way of getting referred to the mainland? Uh, can the GP refer you or does it have to be from the consultant? Um, I don't, I think part of that might be down to um, how your funding is worked. So that'll be up to funding. So in what, if it's, um, if the GB can refer, then they have to get an okay. Uh, so you'd have to work out where does the funding come from as to who can refer. And then the question is, you know, um, what to refer you to, or is it just to have a fresh look and say, yeah. okay, how do we just look at this and just see what's not worked, why it hasn't worked, what can we do differently uh, and go from there? We just feel that Northern Ireland is just such a small place that there's not enough, it's not their fault or fault really, it's yeah. not specialists really, uh, so, frustrating. I think just um, I talked to your GP about, you know, how the referral could be made and, yeah. and then it can go either way. Good. Okay, thank Thanks. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you and all the best to you. I hope, hope you get the help Thank you, you need. Thank you very much for this today. No problem. So I'll go to Tammy Butler. You, you've got a question. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've got a few. I've got another autoimmune disorder. So I've got a rheumatologist, a hematologist and a neurologist because um, they're trying to uncover a few other things. Um, but I've had ongoing um, migraines, hemiplegic migraines for 15, 20 years, forever in a day. It's probably genetic because my mother has them, my daughter and my son have them. Um, and they knock me out once a week, a couple of days a week. I've taken a bazillion different medications and nothing works. Um, unfortunately, one of the um, uh, medications that I have to take for my blood disorder is warfarin. So I'm quite limited in what pain medications I can take. So I usually just kind of have to suffer through the pain um, the way it is. Um, my main question is, in the midst of doing the diagnoses that they're doing at the moment, they did a um, head MRI and they found white lesions on my brain. Um, but it was dismissed, saying that that was just very normal for migraine sufferers. And I'm just curious, mm. is that normal? Um, <laughs> so that, if you don't mind me asking, what, what, what are the rheumatological and hematological? Um, I've got antiphospholipid anti syndrome. Oh, okay. I've had um, mini strokes in the past. And I've had yeah. 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 So if your profile... So, there is an increased uh, incidence of white matter lesions in migraine with aura. So obviously because hemiplegia is so rare, we don't have a figure. It tends to be more at the back of the brain, but the posterior fossa. Um, it settles out after the age of 50, it all seems to settle out the white matter lesions. When they looked at those white matter lesions compared to disability, it also didn't seem to correlate with disability. So, I think when you have a few white matter lesions, what you have to look at is, is there anything here that might be causing, you know, small strokes to close it off? You treat that. So the main thing here will be you're on the warfarin, so the antiphospholipid is your risk. Yes, you can get it with migraine. Has it got a negative impact? No. Do you need to do anything about it? No, not at this point in time. Oh, I think you're still, you're still on, you're muted again. Sorry, that was me just saying thank you. <laughs> thanks, thank, thanks for that question, Tammy. So Lisa, you have a question. Oh, you're on mute again. Hi, yeah, so I think it's the same question everyone else is asking. So mm. I started suffering, I've always been a migraine sufferer from um, teens, I was on beta blockers. Um, I had regular migraine and severe chronic headaches throughout my life uh, it was only 10 years ago I had a head injury mm. um, a bizarre head injury and from that I now have hemiplegic migraines mm. which um, took a long while 
for me to actually realise that yes, it is a hemiplegic migraine, and they're petrifying, and they are people are quite dismissive. Um, mm. When you're at oh, it's just a hemiplegic migraine. Well, okay, within ten minutes, I've gone from being a perfectly health and healthy and well person to being unconscious and losing the use of my right side and not being able to string a sentence together. So, um, mm. one of the questions I've got for you, which is the same as a lot of other people there lifestyle wise what mm. can we do because i myself meditate i you know yeah. i exercise i eat healthily and yeah. don't feel it makes much of a difference so i think part of it so there's a couple of things so looking at the typical things that make it worse lack of sleep too much sleep etc so we know particularly in chronic migraine the things we can do something about uh medication overuse high body mass index sleep pattern and there seems to be the people preceding the chronicity the depression so the higher the, the more severe the depression the more likely it you are to get the chronicity so those are things we can treat so mm. you know very vigilant with mood anxiety which we know are comorbid mm. may need treatment but combination with clinical psychology that works better in the longer term good sleep mm. pattern lots of myths about sleep definitely no medication overuse, um, get your weight optimal. And then what I look at, sleep, not missing meals, pacing, really important to pace your activities because what people do is they have a good day, they do everything and then they crash and burn. Yeah. Pacing is so, so hard. And to some extent, and this is where clinical psychology also helps, is that you sort of have to accept that okay, I just, I can't do it the way I want to do it. Not yet mm. anyway. Mm. I have to reshift my goal pattern and re and change it. So you give your brain a break, really. You, you're looking after yourself. Mm. Um, so the pacing is really difficult. Occupational therapist can help you with pacing activities, looking at home, looking at work. It's always about, you know, what do you have to do? What don't you have to do? What do you want to do? And actually a lot of things you feel you have to do, you probably don't. Okay. So with that so I suffer with severe depression and anxiety um it does actually coincide with my head injury and the onset of the hemiplegic migraines I manage it through again diet exercise and so on but you're yeah. saying about a clinical psychologist that can help manage yeah. that which will help in turn manage my hemiplegic migraines yeah how do I access this because yes. I kind of get sent to a neurologist oh it's hemiplegic migraine try this medication um, I was I was on Candesartan okay. um, last year. I had zero attacks, which yeah. is amazing. I compared to other people, I think I'm blessed with the, with the attacks that I have. Yeah. This year I've had three attacks, but each with me, my attacks last for months before I'm able to function again. Weeks, yeah. if I'm lucky, catch it early in the very early stages of aura, I can get away with. 10 days to two weeks mm. so how do I access any of this it's um, like I think all of us feel a bit lost with a lack yes, of support I agree. so um the way I've done it is through IAPT improving access to psychological therapies which mm -hmm. is self-referral for your borough which means you don't the GP doesn't have to pay for it which means they can't stop you having it mm -hmm. it is then a bit hit and miss because it, the need is so huge for everyone, for everything. But I, it definitely in the last 10 years, it has got better. It has got mm. better. Because, mm. you know, whatever the disorder, it's learning how to live with it and manage it. Mm. There's a mood, anxiety, but on top of that, not just that, is how do I manage this disability? Mm. So I first try IAPT, improving access to psychological therapies, and mm -hmm. see how you get on with that first. Okay. And again, like you say there, you refer to it quite often as disability, and I'm sure. Mm. A lot of other people have the same issue. I have to work, and I know. It, I know it's not your area. Is there any support out there for us to it actually is, acknowledge that it yeah. is a disability? It, 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 it you know, it's debilitating. So it, is, it is registered, so it's a registered disability. Your right. your workplace is obliged to support you with that. Right. So you you have to you register with occupational health. Right. And you look at your environment, you look at your pacing, you need to help you pace. And the problem is that a lot of employers, they may not do it, but 
legally they don't have a leg to stand on, but it's so traumatic going through that process. But actually I have found that occupational health departments have generally been good mm. because then they said, okay, if I can do X days at home, they've allowed me to do that. Mm. In the pacing, you get the occupational therapist in. You, if you're on a PC, ergonomics, getting the lighting down, just optimizing mm. it. So occupational health, definitely. Okay. And okay, it is registered. It is a registered disability yes. with that. Yes. yes. It's the second okay. most disabling disorder after stroke below the age of 50. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for all your time. And yeah. Yeah. So basically, luck. it's about taking it easy and not overdoing it. Um, I can't stress that enough. Yeah. You know, it's just not worth it. At some point, you might be able to but not while you're suffering. If you had a fractured leg, would you run round? Would you run round the garden? Do a 400 metre? No. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Sanish, and thanks for your question, Lisa. So, Melanie Ardell has a question. Hi, um, thank you ever so much. This is really, really helpful, really informative. And, uh, and it's really nice, to, I mean, I've, I've, I've really feel for everyone here who's suffering I really really do but um on a positive note it's actually quite reassuring to see that or to meet other people with um this condition I'm just so sorry that you you know you all have to um, deal with it um and I wish you all well um my most of my questions have been answered actually because um I was really interested in the in the lifestyle and how we access support about that um my other question really was to do with um, so my, I was diagnosed with hemiplegic migraine, but listening to this, I'm, I'm the dog here. Um, listening to this, I'm wondering if I, I seem to relate more to the brainstem um, yes. diagnosis. So um, seventy percent of people yes. with hemiplegic have brainstem symptoms. So uh, you, right, as long yes, as you yeah. have the hemiplegia you fall into the hemiplegic because the genetics are probably slightly different, but right. yes, yeah. brainstem symptoms. Oh, no, thank you. Um, now, what I used to find is that I was very much right-sided. Um, so I got the right-sided weakness and I get quite violent jerks with when an attack comes on. So it's when it starts, I, I feel a bit disorientated. I'd get no headaches whatsoever. And it feels like a fist has got into this quarter of my head and is almost like squeezing it or, or pulling it quite disorientated and then um the speech then I get a lot of speech disturbance and uh, and and then the jerking starts but now I get it bilateral it's both yeah. sides and I find that as time goes on it it gets more violent the, it, 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 I look like I'm having an epileptic it, it looks like epilepsy now stroke doctor stroke consultant has said they used to think that they used to believe that migraines are more um vascular related but now mm, the research shows that they're more related to epilepsy um i have informed the dvla i've, I've told them that i do have a plan that if i feel an attack comes coming on mm. i pull up to one side i phone a friend to come and pick me up and then I collect the car when it's safe. So thankfully, I've been able to keep my uh, driving license. Yeah. Um, I do have other comorbidities. I've got ankylosing spondylitis. So I'm on anti-TNF and non-steroid anti-inflammatories. Um, but I, I just I've, I've found that, like most people here, I've found um, I found it very difficult to to get the right treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I was taken to A and E by um, a friend once who was more concerned than I was. They don't phase me these attacks as much because I, I'm used to them. It's scare. I find it scares people who are my yeah. friends and family who have to witness it. They find it quite scary. So um, just more to to reassure my friend, I went to A and E, but I was given some atriptan. Mm. And um, when I spoke to my GP about it, he said, oh, crumbs, we've never I've never given you this before because you because I said, why have I not been given it before? And mm. he said, oh, because you um, it, it doesn't help. We only give it for the pain. But mm. this is what you've been saying. It's it nice. doesn't. But I find it whether or not it just calms me. I, I do find yeah. it helps. It I do be. find there are um, quite a lot of people who do say if they take it, it helps. Um, so that's why they did the placebo controlled and then found uh, you know, yes, it yes. doesn't. But at the end of the day, if you find it works, 
the main thing is it doesn't, it has no negative effect on aura because people often get very worried, hemiplegic brainstem aura, prolonged mm -hmm. aura. But actually there are reports of people taking a trip down and aborting it. So I think if it works for you, mm -hmm. it's fine. Right, okay. It's fine. So, thank you. Yeah, because I was just listening to this and thinking, oh, should I not be taking it then? Yeah, if um, it works consistently, yes, yeah. then it's fine. Mm -hmm. For some people it will. Yes, yes, but I, um, and I can, some of the things that you've been saying about the lifestyle, like I find if I'm, um, if my sleep patterns are disturbed, well, quite, they quite often yeah. are because they of, are. of my, of my pain and I have a neurogenic, neurogenic bowel and bladder and yeah. bag and ileostomy, so I'm quite often woken up at night. And um, so I find that that, that can often be my, tr my trigger. It's very well hard. It's, it's interesting. It's very hard looking after yourself. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think one question to say to everybody: just sit down and think, am I looking after myself? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, which the majority of people it will, we will be, you need to invest a bit more time. Yes, you know? yeah. I love, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was under a health psychologist through the pain clinic. Oh, so I, I get really bad. Um, facial pain as well and uh, I found it really really useful so all the yeah. things that you've been saying as well about the lifestyle was um so I, I think I need to re I need to go back and readdress the things that I learned there yeah um yeah, because absolutely. I did some mindfulness and um uh, you know a pacing and I had, I had more of a routine I probably slipped a bit so yes um so yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. but yeah, thank you yeah. so much it's been no, it's incredibly helpful That's sorry good. i'll let other people i'm, uh, yeah, I'm taking over I'll, I'll step back now <laughs> but thank you. No thank you thank you for that question and thanks anisha for the answer so but we're actually just at one o'clock so i'll take three more questions so there's there's matilda sarah and gail in that order so to take those three three final questions thank you hi Hello. Hi. Um, I had sudden onset hemiplegic migraine about two and a half years ago now. Mm -hmm. And it we thought I'd had a stroke, went through what most people do, the ambulance, and it never went. And then since mm -hmm. then, um, it's just daily auras. But I do have a fantastic neurologist. I'm really, really lucky. And I'm a year into Botox. Mm -hmm. And it has certainly stopped the severity i.e. I can get up and function and um, live more like a normal human being. Mm. But I, and I feel like a lot of my getting better has been acceptance, that life is different now and this is part of me. And I have to sort, I call it the little beast that lives in my neck. And, and I feel that helps me get better. But I still can't wrap my head around how all day, all day long and through the night, I have different auras that just come and go. All day, there's always something, um, you know, be it my arms numb and tingling. My neurologist said mine are in my brainstem, actually, more than anything, because my tongue goes numb. And... But one of the biggest things that I've never, I keep forgetting to ask him, one of the most unnerving things I get is a, like an internal tremor. Yeah. And yeah. it's the most, it's not a shaking, it's not like a nervous thing it is just that my it's like my whole system inside is completely overwhelmed yeah and it gets this really ridiculous tremor is that heard of yeah yes so that's not part of the aura uh, that's normally anxiety um the internal tremor uh, and what people forget about anxiety is anxiety doesn't always have to be a response to something yeah it's and it's a constellation of symptoms and they can come out of the blue for no reason. Mm. Um, so I've always found that the internal tremor has ended up being anxiety right. and treating that improves it. Yeah. Um, and I'm really pleased you brought up the acceptance because um, I do facial pain clinics as well. And they've been, you know, they're much better than we are in headache because I think they've been going for longer. But they always say that until you get full acceptance, you don't move on. And I've absolutely seen that in clinics. And the problem is you can't force the acceptance. Mm -hmm. It will come to you when it comes. And I think the psychologists help you to get there. And part of it is, OK, I have it. It's the way it is. But to get your head around that and the frustration is huge. Um, but I think this is internal tremor. Uh, it is normally anxiety 
Right, okay. Have you heard of other people who do just have auras? I mean, obviously I have my bigger attacks mm. and I, my baseline is 25 migraines a month. So I mean, I feel like I'm in a migraine state the majority of my life yeah. to varying degrees. Sometimes it'll floor me for three days and then other times like today I'm functioning with just quite bizarre things going on. Have yeah. you heard of other people? Who yes. that so, so persistent aura is well recognised. It's not common and you probably, I suppose this is anecdotal more than anything, often see it a lot with hemiplegic because the hemiplegic out of all of them, like the size, they're longer. Yeah. And sometimes what people say, well, I've had the attack, I'm largely all right, but it never feels normal. Yeah, there's never, I can remember in the early days when it, I was really poorly, I was really in a bad way and everyone kept saying how to keep a diary, but there was no mm. beginning, middle and end. No, it can fluctuate. And I mean, hemiplegia is one of the things from a, a research perspective, which would be great because you can capture the aura. We can find out okay, what's happening when you're good and not so good. Whereas all the other auras pass within about 60 minutes. So, so much hard to get. Uh, but yes, we definitely see it. Uh, persistent aura is very difficult to treat. Sorry, just one more really quick one. Is that what makes me feel so tired? <laughs> yes. So fatigue so if you look fatigue um is all part and parcel of all this and when you see exhausted because you feel on fire yeah. everything's just so active and on fire that it just feels yeah just utterly exhausting it is a real stamina process having this it is a real so, deep deep and really so it's um, <laughs> the most common in in the episodic migraine it's the one of the most common pre-drome and postrome is fatigue. Yeah. So that's where the pacing comes in. So people who have yeah. chronic fatigue, it's about the pacing because we don't know where the, the brain structure is that causes it. How do we switch it, tone it down? Yeah. So at the moment, it's it's pacing. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'll turn myself off. <laughs> Next is Leah. Sarah, Sarah, or Gail, two questions. So Sarah, would you like to connect? Yeah, hi. Um, uh, firstly, um, Matilda, you sound just like me. Um, a lot of, lot of what you've just said is is pretty um, similar, I guess, to what I'm going through. Um, I was diagnosed with like chronic brainstem migraines, um, but I sort of feel like I've got a mix of pretty much everything we've talked about today, which is fun. Um, I just wondered, uh, from a pain management point of view um every drug I've taken that sort of had any kind of impact on the pain at least um because I'm in pain 24 7 sorry I feel like I look really rough today I'm just a stupid amount of pain. um but like I've tried codeine and codeine like took the edge off it mm. um and then was told that I couldn't take that from a, an overuse point of view. And, and then they said, try aspirin and I've taken aspirin. And, and mostly at the minute, I live with like a cold pack on my head because that's about all I can yeah. sort of do. But, but the pain is just, is so debilitating at the minute. I, I don't know what to do. So painkillers and headache in migraine absolutely it's a no-no no because we just know it winds it up and nothing works so the cgrp only the first ones that have some data so we'll see what happens uh but until the painkillers go nothing works and what they showed was that it becomes it's part of our behavior and so the only thing you, you can, and also that when you stop, 45% better, 45% no different, 10% worse. If you then try the preventatives, 60, 70% better, 30%. So the probability of being worse off the painkillers is I'm, much I'm not. I'm not really on any painkillers okay. at the minute. It's just, it's just what to do other than taking painkillers, because because if you can't take painkillers, how so, do you deal with okay. the pain? With the preventatives, have you been on some preventative treatments? I've I've tried thousands, well, not thousands now. I've tried I've tried a lot, and then I've also had the HIV, and I've just had my second round of Botox. But that, 
I don't know when yeah. that's likely to kind of kick in if it's going to do anything. Yeah. Um, so, so I would actually go back to the lifestyle clinical psychology because particularly in chronic migraine, it just reroutes. And I, I think, you know, other pain subspecialties as learned this years ago with headache, because it's so paroxysmal, we focus on that, but none of the drugs so far have made a difference to chronic migraine. Let's see what happens with things like a Jovi, because I think it's not all about the drugs because the brain works differently. So I think, you know, the whole multidisciplinary pain management, so physio, OT, pacing, clinical psychology. And what I found is then it starts dropping down and drugs that hadn't worked start working. And the painkillers, you just, just get rid of them forever. Unfortunately, if you're a migraine, you just have to be so careful if your migraine's active, you know. Is there anything sort of short term other than like cold packs and stuff that I can... Eat? No, that, that is the problem with chronic migraine. There is no quick fix, there is no short term, and it's about investing in the long term. Um, and life is all about quick fixes. That's the problem, whatever we do. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you for your question, Sarah. And then the final, and Anish for answering it. And then the final question to Gail, would Hello. you like to ask? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, um, I can hear you, Gail. Yeah. Hi, um, I've um, been suffering with hemiplegic migraines for eight years after a um, really stressful period. But for the last few years, I've got a permanent stiffness um, on my left side. So the fact that even today when I smile, I can't smile properly. Yeah. And I also have um, varying degrees of pain in my hip. And that's, con that's constant every day. And that's been like that for several years now. I just is that related to the hemophilic migraine? Um, so the answer, I, I, I don't know. Have you, have you seen a neurologist to examine you? To a, um, a multi-skeletal um, specialist in a week's time. Uh, sorry, a multi. Uh, skeletal. I can't. I can't say the word very well. Okay. Um, um it's because the doctors. Oh, muscular skeletal. Right. Cool. Yes. Um, I think the first thing for your GP just to make sure that there is no neurological stiffness. Yeah. And then they can, ref you know, to make sure there's nothing else going on. And then you feel a bit more reassured to say, okay, let's have a look at, at more of a rehab approach. Right. Um, but I think just first of all, to make sure is, you know, is the perception of stiffness correlated by neurological stiffness? Okay. Um, and if it's not, then yes, the musculoskeletal can come in and again, they have a multidisciplinary input to it. Yeah, it's just been yeah, ongoing for several years and I literally every day is various degrees of stiffness, depending on how active or inactive I've been. Yeah, the so I think the whole thing will be that if it's not sort of something, you know, that when you do your tone reflexes, etc., then it's about putting a structure into place so that that stiffness, it, it doesn't become permanent, that you remain mobile. Yeah, that's what I feel. That's an really, important yeah. thing, yes. Um, and face masks have been a blessing this last year. Okay. So, yeah, I was not. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see him next week and then. Um, yeah, and see what, see what they say, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Gail, thank you for that question and Nish for answering it. And all the best with your appointment next week. I, we hope that you get the help you need. So thank you so much, Anish, for mm -hmm. coming along today. And just it, it's just it was the most fantastic presentation I've learned. I work with the migraine I learned a lot through it. And I, I, I think everyone else um, has too. The, and, and thank you for everyone who asked questions. It, it really no, helped to draw out some of the key points. So 